Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's invite the Holy Spirit today to be our teacher. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, thank you for this wonderful house that you've, uh, you've given to us, Lord, and we just are so blessed. We don't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, Lord. We don't come to church to fulfill a ritual or a tradition. We come to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus that's the senior leader of this house. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, would be our counselor. Show us and lead us and guide us and guard us and motivate us to, to do and to be all that you've called us to be out of your word. And Lord, I thank you that all that you've done for us and blessed us with, Lord, we thank you for those blessings here in this, at this house. We don't ever think of ourselves as better or greater than anybody else, but rather we are co-laborers in the body of Christ. So Lord, we ask that you would bless our brothers and sisters all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you would bless our Catholic brothers and sisters, all the churches belonging to the various denominations that preach Jesus Christ resurrected and our Savior. Lord, we thank you for our Calvary Chapel brothers and sisters, our local churches, churches like Harvest and Grove. Lord, we thank you for uh, the way. Lord, we ask that you bless Water of Life and Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist, Victory, New Creation, Oak Valley. Lord, all the churches in the Inland Empire and around the world, Lord, we ask that you would bless them as you have blessed us because we are brothers and sisters in Christ working together to build your kingdom, Lord, for your glory. Father, we thank you that you would continue to bless and have your hand upon Pastor Jim in his recovery process. We ask that you would move in his body, Lord, that the cells and the tissues would reconnect and heal. And Lord, I pray that he would be stronger each and every day than he was the day before. And we pray, Lord, that his latter years would be greater than his former. Thank you for giving to us such wonderful leaders as Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah. Bless them, Lord, as they take this time to recover and to rest. And Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. We pray that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're taking your seats, go ahead and grab your Bible or get your phone or your device, whatever it is that you've got your Bible on. Grab your Bible, go with me to the book of Hebrews. If you're just joining us, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. We're in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Really exciting. I mean, it has taken us a long time to get into Hebrews chapter 11. We finally made it, and it is so good. We've been in a series, and we're going to continue that series. Uh, the, the title of the message is Defining Faith, this week, part number three. What we've been doing in looking at Hebrews chapter 11 is really looking at what faith is, looking at the def definition, literally defining what faith is. But now we're going to really get into the subject of faith and get into this topic of faith and to see how all of a sudden not only are we defining faith, but now we're beginning to see how faith begins to define us in our lives. And so I'm excited for the Word of God and for the message that we've got in store. I want to encourage you, buckle your seatbelts because we are going to get deep and it's going to be good and it is so important for us to get a hold of that. So as you can see, we're in Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse number one. We've gotten really far into Hebrews chapter 11. Here's how far we've gotten. If you look at your Bibles, we're here we are. Today we're talking about these words. Now faith. There we go. Three weeks, we've made it two words in. No, I'm just kidding. We've, we, we've gotten through Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. Now, faith is the substance. Some might say the, the, the confidence, the backing of things hoped for. It's the evidence, the proof of things that are not seen. So over the past couple of weeks, if you haven't been with us, or maybe this is your first time joining us, what we've been doing and looking at the subjects is defining faith. Week number one, we talked about what faith is. What is faith? I mean, if we're going to live a life of faith, we really need to understand what faith is. And simply, faith is what we believe. It's a persuasion. It's a conviction based upon what we have heard. So faith is, is the Word of God, the, the definition there on, on Hebrews. That is, like you could put that in Webster's Dictionary uh, as the definition. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It's, it's our belief, it's our conviction, it's our persuasion. Last week we discussed uh, the second part of that in Defining Faith Part 2 was how do we get faith? I mean, does it just drop from the sky on us? I mean, does, does God just kind of give us a little injection of it? Or how do we get faith? And so we discussed the topic of how faith comes. We found that in Romans the 10th chapter, verse number 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. We saw the process. How shall they believe if they have not heard? How shall they hear if they have not been taught? How shall they be taught if they have not been sent? So we realize that there has to be something sent, the Word of God sent by God to teach us so that we might hear it, that we might believe it. And so faith comes by hearing. And then, the most important, is by hearing and then accepting it as truth. 
So we learn that faith is what we believe. It's a persuasion. It's a conviction in our lives. It's not based on assumption. I remember the story once of Pastor Jim telling us about a lady that had told him that she had faith to marry a man on the other side of church. And she pointed out that man and says, I, I've got faith. I'm going to marry that man. And, and when Pastor Jim saw that man, he was married already. That's not faith. It's got to be based on the word of God. Otherwise, it's presumption. So faith is our belief based on the word of God. It comes from hearing and then accepting it as truth. Today we're going to go further into the subject of defining faith and really to look at how faith begins to define us in our lives. I've got little kids. I've got a, a four-year-old or he's turning four in a month or so. And then I've got a little two-year-old. So my world has been consumed with cartoons and fairy tales and stories. We have relinquished control of the television show. We're so excited when the kids go to bed because then we can watch adult TV. And uh, so my life has been consumed with cartoons and, and, and fairy tales. And we took our kids to Disneyland. And Disneyland has this this fireworks show at the end of the night and it's dark and they've got fireworks and they're on, I think it's like Cinderella's or Sleeping Beauty, somebody's castle on Disneyland, I don't know, there's a castle. On the castle they have these video images that are projected and it's all the different songs from the, from the, the cartoons, you know, things like Snow White and Cinderella and Aladdin and, and, and Peter Pan and all these things and, and it's all cued to music and fireworks and it's so moving. I mean, we're sitting there, we're just like, wow, that's so cool. And then the whole theme is, is belief. If you've ever seen a fairy tale or you've ever been to, you know, you know seen the, the, heard the story of Snow White or, you know, someday my prince will come. If I just believe true love will find a way, you know, Peter Pan, just, just, just think happy thoughts, believe. You know, I remember the, the movie Hook, I believe. You know, everybody's clapping and he jumps up and he flies away. And, and, so our, our world, through stories, through folklore, through, through, through fairy tales, our society tells us that, that we, we need to believe. Just, just believe and, 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 and things will begin to change. And, you know, I started to think about it. You know, faith is oftentimes feels a lot like that. You know, it, it's our belief. It's what we believe. Literally, faith is our belief. So sometimes it seems like, you know, like Jiminy Cricket singing Wish Upon a Star. It seems like if I just believe, like I'm wishing upon a star, but then I've replaced that star with God. But you see, there's a difference between what society tells us and just believe and your world will change. Just believe and good things will happen. Just believe and your prince will come. That's a fairy tale. There's a difference between a fairy tale and a functional faith. So then what separates fairy tale faith from functional faith? Because, you see, we don't want to just live a life that's a fairy tale. I mean, as much as every one of us would say, oh, I'd love to live a fairy tale life and live in a castle and, and, and you know, whatever. We want to have a life that is functional. A faith that doesn't just, you know, tell a good story. A faith that does something, that brings about change, that changes our circumstance, that changes our, our, our present uh, situation, that changes or that works in the lives of our children, in our finances, in our own lives, in our own thoughts, in our own mentality, in, in our jobs or our businesses. We need this functional faith. So what separates functional faith from fairy, fairy tale faith? Well, exactly that. One's a fairy tale. And one's functional. You think about it, which one do you and I want? Well, we want the one that's going to bring about change. After all, how many have ever had their fairy godmother show up on their doorstep and sing bippity boppity boop and change their situation with a wave of a little wand? Nobody. Why? Because it's a fairy tale. Which means we need to live in a world of functional faith and not fairy tale faith. So the question arises for you and I, how do we have a functional faith? And that's what we're going to talk about today in defining faith, part number three. How do you have a functional faith? A faith that does something in your life and not just a fairy tale story wishing upon a star. Well, in order to answer that, since I've been talking about Disney and since I've been talking about fireworks and fairy tales, I'll just give you a real easy term. How do you have functional faith? Super easy. Ready? Let it go. Well. <laughs> How must you have functional faith? Here it is. Your faith must be released and must be let go. It must be sowed. You see, faith, contrary to what you may have thought or what you may have even been taught, 
Your faith alone by itself will not bring about the change that you need. Oh, what? I, 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 gotta, I gotta have faith. Yes. But if faith alone was the vessel of change for our lives, then everything or anything we believed for, we would have. You know what that is? That's called a fairy tale. We don't live a fairy tale faith. So faith by itself does not bring about the change that we need. As a matter of fact, we're, we're there in Hebrews 11 chapter, verse number one, look at it again. It says that faith is the substance, the confidence, it's the backing of things hoped for. But then it goes on and it says it's the evidence or proof of things not seen. You know, we talked about this in week number one, Pastor Dan talked about Perry Mason and the proof and the evidence and the, 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 the court of law. You know that evidence exists to prove that something else exists. You don't see in a court, judge, I'd like to present to you exhibit A into evidence. Exhibit A is here to produce or to prove that exhibit A exists. No, that doesn't work. Evidence proves that something else exists. So your faith is evidence. Your faith is substance. It does not by itself bring about change. So we have got to put our faith into action by letting it go, by sowing it, by doing something about our faith. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us a lot about this. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of James. James in the second chapter, James really begins to address this. The, the, the epistle or the, the, the writing of James really begins to address the subject of Christianity in its emptiness. The, the, just the word service of Christianity. Just the image. I want to be a Christian, but just look the image. James hits every little nail on the head saying, you can't just look the part. You've got to be the part. And so in James in the second chapter, he talks a lot about this. James chapter number two, beginning in verse number 14, it says... What does it profit, my brethren? Think about that for a moment. You want profit in your life. You want financial profit. You want to have a reason to live, fulfillment. You want to have profit with your children. You want to have a legacy. You want gain in your life. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? He asks this hypothetical question with an implied answer. The question is, can faith save him? So here's a man that says, I've got faith, but he, does no, he has no works, no actions, no deeds. He says, can faith save him? And so now James begins to paint this picture and he says in verse number 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and be filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Where is the game? So imagine here a friend or a family member without a coat on a cold day, without food in their stomach. They haven't eaten in a couple of days. You can hear their stomach growling and you can see them shivering from the elements. And all you say to them is, oh man, I got to get going. But you know what? I just, be warmed. Oh, I hear your stomach growl. Be filled and walk away. What good does that do? When you leave, it's still cold. When you leave, they're still hungry. And so he's saying, what good does it do to just say that to them? Thus also, he says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, here comes the argument. Someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. And James says, show me your faith without your works and I will show you mine by my works evidence. Remember that? He's confirming what Hebrews chapter 1 or 11 verse number 1 says. I will show you my evidence by my works. Verse number 19 is a really bold statement to us. It says, for you say or you believe that there is one God and you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. You might have a belief. You might have a, a, a persuasion. You might have heard something and accepted it as truth. But even the devil and demons in hell believe and tremble, yet it has not gained them anything. That's an amazing statement to compare us like that. But he says, oh, do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Again, repeats that statement. 
He begins to tell us, wasn't Abraham justified by offering Isaac his son and his faith combined with his works was perfected by God? Wasn't Rahab justified or wasn't she uh, perfected in her works because she was the only person in Jericho to listen to the words of the Hebrews and then she, was, she hid them and she was saved and found herself in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he goes on and he concludes in verse number 26 and he says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Three times, James says that statement. Now, interestingly enough, that little five little word in modern Christianity, in the American church, gets everybody ruffled up. What's that five little word you say, Pastor Luke? Works. We say, well, hey, I'm not bound by the works. I'm not committed to works. Works don't justify me. I'm not saved by works. And you'd be right in saying that. But to understand the context of what James is talking about. James is discussing that the proof of your belief in Jesus Christ is backed by the evidence of your works. Whereas Paul in Galatians and in Romans is talking about you are justified by Jesus Christ alone and not by the works of the law. Two completely different subjects. As a matter of fact, some of your translations might even say something like deeds. If you have the New Living Translation, it says faith without deeds is dead. Or how about this in the New Living Translation? Your faith without action is dead. Because you see, our works is doing something with our faith. It must be released. It must be sowed. As a matter of fact, I've got a, a little illustration I want to show you. I'm sure many of you were wondering, why does Pastor Luke have a cart with a plant on it? Well, I, I wanted to show you a quick little illustration here. I've got a bag of seeds. This is actually kind of a really cool bag of seeds. It, it, it's, it's actually called Seeds of Change. Uh, that's kind of cool. But this is a bag of dark green lettuce seeds. In this bag, this seed contains dark green green lettuce. That's good. You know, you, you put that on your sandwich when you can eat meat again. Praise God for the fast in January. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but you know, the seed in this bag, if left in this bag, will never accomplish anything. That's right. yeah. I can believe as much as I want that the seed in this bag will give me dark green lettuce. But if I don't ever take the seed out of this bag and do something with it, it will always remain a seed. Yeah. Your faith is a lot like a seed. You hold on to it. You believe it and you do well, like James says. But holding on to your faith and doing nothing with it will not bring about the change that you so desire and that you so need in your life. Your faith must be released. If I take a seed out of the bag and I plant it into the dirt, then all of a sudden something begins to happen. That little tiny seed underneath the ground becomes a plant and that plant becomes a lettuce plant where now I can look at that and say the salad that I'm going to eat, oh thank you Lord for the fast, is so good and fulfilling and rich. Your faith, if you do not sow it, if you do not plant it, if you do not release it, let it go, will not accomplish anything in your life. Yes, amen. So, okay, we've got it. Pastor Luke, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with you. I got to release my faith. I got to let it go. How do I let my faith go? It's, how do we release our faith? Oh, it's so easy. It, it, it's, it's absolutely the easiest thing you're going to be like, seriously, that's it? It is. How do we release our faith? Two simple ways. By what we say and by what we do. Yes. Our actions. The term corresponding action. Corresponding literally means to agree. So our actions are in agreement with our faith. So your corresponding action by your words is backing what you have heard and you have accepted as truth and now you are speaking it. Your corresponding actions by what you do, your deeds, your actions, your life is taking what you have heard and accepted as truth and now you are releasing it into your life. Yeah. You see, what you say has a lot to do with the outcome of your circumstance. Your words have power. Yeah. 
The Bible tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So you can speak life and faith or you can speak death over your situation. And what you say is sowing the seed of your belief. I was thinking back to when dad was going in with the surgery. You know, he was talking. He says, you know, Luke, I'm 70 years old. And, 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 and somebody my age, when they go through surgery, they just don't recover. They just never come back, and it's, it's just not the same. I can, and he's naming all these people, and it's, you know, thinking about it, I was talking to the family. He says, man, how old was your mom, grandma, when she had her open heart surgery? Oh, wow, she was, she was, you know, she was up there in her 80s. How old was mom's, mom's father, my grandfather, who's still alive? How old was he when he had his fourth quadruple bypass? Oh, he was, you know, he was up in there, and he's still alive. My, my, my wife, we were talking about it. Her, her grandfather had a double hip replacement at 86 years old and still lived. You see, death and life is in the power of the tongue. You can speak, well, I'm, I may not come back. I may, not, I may not recover. Or you can begin to say, no, I will. I will. Because the word of God is true and alive and just. And my belief says it. My faith has said it. My actions, my deeds, my words, my, my proof, your deeds are the proof of your life. That's why James says, I'll show you my faith by my works, my actions, the proof, the evidence that something beyond me exists. I love William Boothy, uh, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, said the word like this. He said, faith and works go together like the footsteps of a marching man. That one, one foot reaches out in faith, followed by the footstep of works, followed by the footstep of faith, followed by works, followed by faith, followed by works, followed by faith, to the point you can scarcely determine which is faith and which is works. They go hand in hand together. Your faith must be released, must be sowed, and it comes in two vessels. What you say, your corresponding action with your words, and your corresponding action with your deeds. I think back to the story in Matthew chapter 14. Peter and the boat with the disciples. The, the storm is on the Sea of Galilee and, and there they're out in the boat in the middle of the sea and they see what they think is a ghost and they all cry out for fear. And, and, and somebody says, it's Jesus. And so Peter shouts out, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And so you know how the story goes. Jesus says, it is I, come. And so Peter says, thanks, Jesus. I just wanted to make sure. No, you know the story. We often see it as a failure on Peter's part, but realize that Peter was the only other human being in existence to walk on water. Why? Because his corresponding action, his faith was released. He got out of the boat and he walked on the water. Our faith must be released. But you know, sometimes we can get into trouble because there's, there's a little bit of a, a, of a requirement with the releasing of our faith. You see, the releasing of your faith must be the releasing of your belief. Which means you can only release your belief. Your actions must be the release of your belief. Which means you don't say something because somebody else said it. Or you do something because somebody else said it did it. We get ourselves into trouble all the time. Well, so-and-so said this, so I'm going to say that. So-and-so said this, so I'm going to say that. So-and-so did this and they got healed, so I'll do that. But you see, your actions must be the release of your, I got it in all bold and caps because it's so important, must be the release of your belief. Your belief belief. I remember I was in Bible college and in our Bible college 14 years ago, we were, we had a class and every time we had to stand up and we had to hold up our Bible, this is my Bible. I believe what it says it is. I believe it says what I can believe. I am what it says I can be. I, 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 you know, I can do what it says I can do. And we go through this whole thing. And it was like this, you'd repeat this phrase, but like you heard with Pastor Dan, if you don't accept it as truth, then it doesn't make a difference what you do. Why? Because faith is not this abracadabra formula. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts in the 19th chapter, there's a story of some guys and they see that the, that, that the apostles and the disciples are literally casting out demons and that these guys make money doing that. So they're thinking, man, we, we, we can make a pretty lucrative business. So they find somebody with a demon and they say, hey, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. Because that's what Paul was saying, in the name of Jesus. So, well, hey, we'll, we'll just follow suit. The demons respond and they say, hey, we know who Jesus is. We know who Paul is, but we don't know who you are. And they jump on the guys, beat them up, and they run away naked. 
You see, it's not an abracadabra magical formula. As a matter of fact, talking about what you say and what you do, look at what it says in Romans, the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10. We were there last week talking about how faith comes. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. It's awesome, the formula for salvation. If you believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with your mouth that he raised from the dead, you shall be saved. But look at Romans 10, verse 10. It says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Action. You see, when you believe unto righteousness, you are taking what you heard and accepted as truth, and now it is doing something at work in your life. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Your words. So what you say and what you do is the release of your faith. But it's not the abracadabra magical formula. We've talked about that all the time because it says, for with the heart one believes. It's your actions are the release of your belief. With the mouth, a confession is made unto. With the belief, the actions are the release of your belief. Your words and your deeds are the release of what you have heard and accepted as truth and call faith. So your faith must be released. It has, it's released in two vessels, what you say and what you do. And we've got to realize that our actions must be the release of our own faith. And what happens is oftentimes we, we get into this situation where we think, man, I, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to do. But our faith must be the, the actions of our own belief. If you think about it, I was talking about my devotion in 2 Corinthians. I'll just put it on the overhead for you. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter, Paul the Apostle, after talking about being hard pressed but not crushed and, 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 and you know, afflicted but not destroyed. And he says, we're confident that Jesus is our solution. And he says, and since we have the same spirit, according to what is written in the psalm, I believed, therefore I spoke. Paul says, we believe also, therefore speak. Your actions are the release of your own beliefs. As a pastor, so many times people say, Pastor Luke, this is what's going on in my life. What does the Bible say? Give me something. I need, I need, to, I need to pray. I need to know what the Bible says. And so we'll sit down and we'll talk about some scriptures and tell them, man, you just need to speak these over your life. I'm not saying that you need to go and say, well, Pastor Luke said, you know, I have not been given a spirit of fear. No, because what you are saying is what somebody else said. But what we are doing is telling you, hey, this is a verse you need to read. This is a verse you need to hear. This is a ver verse you need to speak and accept it as truth. And when you accept it as truth, now you can release it as your own belief. And now you are planting and sowing your faith in your situation. So vital for us. So as we begin to release our faith, we look at our problems. Things like our children. Man, I don't know how are my children going to grow up and, and be healthy and safe in a world like this. My finances. How am I going how, how to make it through this economy? My business is on the, on the tail end or it's not looking very good. I need a lot of, I, my, my, I'm in the biggest health challenge of my life. I need faith for my health. And we look at our problems and the bigger they get, we think the bigger our faith needs to be. As a matter of fact, the disciples even asked Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus, we need more of it. But when it comes to your faith, you need to understand something. That size does not matter in your faith. The disciples ask Jesus, Lord, increase my faith. You might be facing a big problem. You might be looking at your kid's future or, the, or your job or your finances or, or whatever the circumstance might be. You might look at the, the recurring issues that you have on side and you say, ah, there's no way I can get, I need more, I need big faith to get over this big problem. But Jesus tells his disciples in Luke 17, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be ripped up by the roots and be cast into the sea and it will listen and obey. You've heard the corresponding verse. Jesus says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall do what you say. Why? Because when your faith, when it comes to your faith, size does not matter. But what does matter is application of your faith. Because otherwise, holding on to it is like keeping the seed in the bag and expecting something to happen. You've got to learn to sow your faith, to let it go, to release it, to put it to work by what you say and by what you do. And they must be the product or the result of your own beliefs, not because somebody told you, but because you believe. 
And then all of a sudden, faith begins to do something. And you'll realize that it's not about size of faith, but rather it's about the working of faith. A little mustard seed sized faith that, that's a, a, a physical illustration will literally change the course of your life. Yes. And faith will begin to define who you are and what you do. Now, don't have faith like this. I heard a story once of a man who was walking near the edge of a cliff and he fell off the edge. And as he fell off the edge, he managed to grab onto a branch. And there, as he was holding onto the branch, he cried out, Help! Is there anybody there? And a voice came and responded, Yes, I'm here. It's the Lord. I'll help you. Lord, help me. I can't hold on much longer. The voice comes back and says, I'll help you. All you need to do is believe. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. Help. If you believe, I've got you. All you need to do is let go. The man looks down at the bottom of the canyon. After a moment of silence, he cries out, Is there anybody else out there? <laughs> Don't have faith like that. But you know, in Luke, the seventh chapter, there's a story of a man, a Roman centurion who came to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Jesus, I need your help. My servant is sick and I'm afraid he's going to die. And Jesus says, okay, let's go pray for him. The centurion says, no, no, no. You see, I'm a man of authority. I understand. I have people that I'm over and I have people that I, I report to. And I know that all you need to do is just say it and my servant will be healed. The Bible tells us in Luke, the seventh chapter, that Jesus turns around to his disciples and to all of his followers and he says he marvels. And Jesus says, I have not found such great faith like this in all of Jerusalem, all of Israel. You see, that man, that centurion's life, his account was recorded in the Bible. And in the subheading of his story, it says, the centurion's great faith. Not only did he understand the principles of authority, but faith defined who he was. Your faith, now that we understand what it is, now that we understand how it comes, when we begin to apply faith in our lives, your faith will begin to define who you are and what you do. Because it must be released. Let it go. Your faith is released by what you say and what you do. Your actions must be the release of your own belief and the understanding that your faith when it comes to faith, size doesn't matter, but the working of it does. Yes, yes. Then our faith will begin to define us in our lives. Yes, yes. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? So listen, before we leave tonight, I want to, or this morning, I want to just take a quick moment. I want to just challenge you because, you know, it would be a travesty. It'd be, it would be awful for us to leave based on the pretense that everybody here is right with God. So I want to ask you a question. I just want you to answer it within your own heart, within your own life. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a simple question. Don't pat it. Don't, don't try to beat around the bush about it. Be honest about it in your own heart. You see, how you answer that question has a lot to say about you and your position or relationship with God. So let's talk about that answer. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you think, because you hope, because you wish, you're going to get to heaven, you can go. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've got a positive outlook on life, because you know you've got this, you know, you're, you're a good thinker, that you're going to get yourself in heaven. You can't get to heaven because of those things. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can get to heaven because your parents told you as a child that you were a Christian, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, because your godparents made a promise for you when you couldn't make a promise when you were a child. You won't find that in the Word of God. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you attended Sunday school or catechism classes as a child, because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're here, you've got a gold star attendance record to church and to hear the pastor preach that you're going to get into heaven. You can't find that in the Word of God. That's not how you get there. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person. Oh, we think, well, if you know... I don't cheat on my taxes and I give to the Red Cross or help my fellow neighbor or try to be a good human being. If I live the good life, I heard somebody say. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can live the good life, be a good person, have good actions, find yourself good enough to get into heaven? You can't get there that way. See, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough. We talked about that. We're not justified by our works. 
We're justified by our faith through Jesus Christ. Our works are a proof or evidence of that. You're not saved by the things that you do on the outside. Doesn't matter how good you are or how, how, how nice you appear to be. Doesn't matter whether you volunteer in the children's or the youth or sing in the choir or carry the pastor's Bible. Or even if you've got a card in your wallet that says you're a member of a church. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're not a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or anything else by the system of classifications that you're going to get into heaven. And nowhere will you find that because you call yourself a Christian, like James addresses in that entire book, that you're going to get yourself into heaven. You cannot get into heaven those ways. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way we can get there is God's way. Jesus, in the book of John, in the third chapter, is speaking with a religious leader of his day. The religious leader asks, how do you get into heaven? How does one get into heaven or have eternal life? Jesus says, you must be born again. You see, it's not what Hollywood, it's not what society has made it out to be or even what you think of it. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing in the eyes and in the heart of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we read it today that the Bible says that the devil and hell and the demons believe and tremble it's one thing to have a carnal knowledge or a mental assent of who God is, to know who Jesus is. I know who the president is, but I do not know him. You can know all about God. You can know all about Jesus, but miss out on the personal relationship that God desires you to have. As a matter of fact, let me prove it to you. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking. Jesus says to his church, his church, he says he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because he says if he finds us lukewarm, Jesus says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whew, shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm in your relationship? Lukewarm simply means, let's just define it, it simply means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. Occasional church attendance, you're kind of doing some of your own things, some of God's, and you're floating around. You're not wholehearted for God, you're not wholehearted against God. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. I know that may rub you the wrong way. It might ruffle your feathers a little bit. But God forgive us in American churches that we've watered the message down for hundreds of years because we've been more interested in the number of people in our chairs than we have been the condition of the souls that sit. More importantly, I respect God enough to tell you, can't get to heaven your way, you can't get to heaven my way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. Jesus Christ is that way. Jesus says these words. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today, let's not do it any other way but God's way. Jesus says these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. But if you deny him, he says, he will deny you. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. You see, God respected you so much that he gave you a free will choice to choose whether or not you want to accept or reject the gift of God through eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. The Bible says it's a gift. You get to choose whether or not you want to accept or reject. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And if that's you in this moment, I want to, in, in this church, I want to challenge you for a moment. I want to ask you to do something. I ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, today, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I need to do that. What you're talking about, you're talking about me. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And you can put your hand right back there. You say, oh, man, if I raise my hand, I might be embarrassed. You might be. But listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. That's not what we're here for. We're rooting you on, cheering you on, believing for you. But if you can't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church, how are you expected to do that outside of the walls of this building? The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. You see, he's already done everything he could to ensure your position with him in heaven forever and ever and ever by giving for you and me, his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, a beat and bloody mess for our sin, for our shame, so that we, be, we could be reconnected with him. You see, the relationship with Jesus Christ goes so far beyond what happens when you die. It begins right now while you live. Jesus says, I have come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Some of you in this place, maybe you've been living life and it's been empty. It's been shallow. You've been searching for meaning all along. This is the moment for you to accept the gift of eternal salvation and abundant life through Jesus Christ. Who should raise their hands in just a moment if that's you? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life, in just a moment, get ready, pop your hand up, I'll see it. Maybe you're not sure you did this at a children's church or in your youth group or you went to a harvest crusade and you prayed that prayer. Remember, it's not about just uh, repeating what somebody else says. It's about belief 
and releasing that belief. If that's you in just a moment, don't walk out of this place without making sure. Who should raise their hands? If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God. Listen, if you've been playing games or playing church, if that's you, listen, come on. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't let another moment pass you by. It doesn't matter if you're in the front row or the back row. Listen, I don't care if you've been in this church for 25 years or if this is your first day. It does not matter. But what does matter is your eternal salvation. And it starts today, right here. You've had dentist, DMV, and doctor appointments. Now it's a divine appointment between you and God. Don't let anything stop you from making the very best decision you can make. It starts by accepting the gift of, of salvation through Jesus and coming into a growing relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior and connected to God. If that's you in this place, get ready. I'm going to count to three. Whether you're in the family rooms, I can see you guys through the windows. The front row, back row. Listen, if you're out in the foyer or on the campus of the church, you hear the sound of my voice and you can watch on the television. Even if you're at home watching on the live stream, this is your moment. This is your time. Wherever you're at today, get ready. Now is the time of your salvation. I'm going to count. When I do, pop your hand up. Be proud about it. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. From the front row to the back row. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you right there. I see you. I see you. I see that hand right there. Four or five wise people already. Anybody else in this place? Where are you at? You see, I got those hands. I got you right over there, sister. In the back, all right, I got you back over there. Six wise people, five or six wise people. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. All right, two, three in the, f two or three in the family? Three in the family room? Two. All right, two in the family room. That's like seven, eight back there. All right, nine. I got you, my man. All right, see you very in the back. I got you. Ten. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. Quit playing games with God. Stop messing around. Let's go forward in your relationship. Accept life by making that decision. Corresponding action like we talked about today starts with your decision. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? Nine, or oh, I got you right there. Nine or ten wise people in the back or all over this place. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for the nine, ten wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do for all of you that raise your hand. You guys in the family rooms, the ushers, they'll help you grab your stuff. If you raise your hand and you're serious about this, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, want to. Now it's time to follow through that corresponding action by doing and saying. We're going to change destinies together. And I want you to get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. For anything you need, for anything you came to family members, hey, bring them with you. Or look to somebody that raised their hand and say, I'll go with you. And get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come and get in the aisle and come meet me up here at this altar. We're going to change destinies together, you and me, right here, right now. So let's all stand. Please, nobody leave as they come forward. If that's you, if you raise your hand, come on, out of your seat, out of your chair. Come meet me up here. We're changing Jesus, destinies today. I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You can come if that's you. Come on. The reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong. If that's you, come on. To you. You're the reason that I live. You can come. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe. We're waiting for you. You're worth it. Come on. Jesus, I Praise God. You guys came. I want to share something fun with you. First of all, I want to tell you something. Hey, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration, all right? Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're making a good choice. The smartest choice you can make. I mean, think about it. You're choosing life. Awesome. That says you're smart. Good job. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you guys just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, the leader of your life. That's what that means. So you're going to pray a prayer. Remember, it's not abracadabra, all right? It's not about repeating a formula. It's about following through your beliefs with corresponding actions. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information. What do you do when you walk out of here? What do I do next? I'm going to help point you in that right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you guys to come back, hang out. We want to hang out with you guys. We want to connect you with a friend here at church to teach you some things about the Word of God. Get you strong in life so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has for you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel.
hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.